Amen. We are so glad to be back in God's house. And uh, I'm now on Facebook, and the world will never be the same. I know it's just a wonderful thing. But <laughs> Psalm 119, 17, and 18. How to be happy. How to be happy. We're going to tell you how to be happy today. How to be happy. Psalm 119, 17, and 18. Everyone wants to be happy, but not many truly are. Did you know that unhappiness is the number one theme of the vast majority of every song ever written? It is about unhappiness. A broken heart. Did you know that a broken that broken heart is the number one phrase in American music? Broken heart. Think of a song right now with the phrase broken heart. How can you mend a broken heart? It's the only one I can think of. <laughs> yeah. Why are we so unhappy? Why are we so unhappy? Well, life is unfulfilling and unsatisfying for most. Most Americans say that life is unfulfilling and unsatisfying. And those are just the Trump, anti-Trump people. Okay, you don't, never mind. We're not, <laughs> that didn't work. Scratch that one off. I'll not use that one again. No more Trump jokes. Uh, people never come to the realization of the source of life the meaning of life and peace. People never come. Uh, most people never come. That's sad. They never come to the realization of the source of life and the meaning of life and peace. Today we look at a man described in the 119, that, a man that described in the 119th Psalm how to be happy. Even though the word happy is not in this Psalm, he gives us a recipe for happiness. Psalm 144.15 says, Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Remember Psalm 144.15. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want to mark it, underline it, whatever you do, check mark it. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 119.17 says, Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Happiness is discovering the source of life. The first key to happiness is discovering the source of life. Not discovering Joel Osteen on TV. He tells you how to be happy. He should be happy. He's got a $20 million home and he's selling his $20 million home because it's not big enough. Be good to me, your servant, the Bible's telling us. And deal bountifully means be good to me, your servant, so that I may live and obey your teachings. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and I will observe your word. I will hear it, receive it, love it, and obey it. The psalmist just wanted to live so that he might live by the Word of God. Happiness is discovering the source of life, and the source of life is the Word of God. He said that I may live and keep thy Word. Deal bountifully with me. Be good to me so that I can live by the Word of God. He considers it a blessing to live so that he might follow the Word of God. Now, he considers it God's goodness to him to let him live, to be able to follow the Word of God. Do you consider it a blessing that you can live and be able to follow the Word of God? Do you consider it a blessing that you even have the Word of God? Most people feel like the Bible is antiquated, outdated, it's not progressive enough, let's just cast it aside and do what we think is right. Isn't that a Romans chapter 1 Christian? They do what's right in their own mind. Listen, there is, uh, there is no reason for, or excuse for anyone not to read the Bible. I know people that can't read, couldn't read anything but learn to read the Bible after they got saved. They can't even read a stop sign. That's what it's read. But they can read the Bible. God has done miracles for people in that way. But there's nothing, no physical handicap that can keep you from reading or, or listening to the Bible. If you can't read, you can listen to the Bible. It's all over the internet. I've got two apps on my phone that just read the Bible to me. And they're free. Uh, there's no reason...
for anyone not to read the Bible. No physical handicap except for blindness can keep you reading the Bible, but you can still listen to it. There's no excuse for any of us not to have the Bible in our lives. Consider how the psalmist considers his life being blessed in every way by the Word of God. Now, true happiness is discovering the source of life. True happiness is knowing that we came from God and we're going back to Him. True happiness is knowing that the Word of God says we came from Him and we're going back to Him. The Word of God answers the mysteries to life. And it's incredible to me that our government spends billions of dollars listening for someone out there that can give them the key to life when it's sitting right on their bedroom table or their coffee table. Well, used to be. A Bible was in every home. I doubt if that's true now. In America, there used to be a Bible on every coffee table. You know the big family Bible that everybody had on their coffee table? Anybody have those anymore? Usually they're put up in the closet. Why do you put your Bible up in the closet? Well, I want to keep it safe. How about reading it and keep you safe? Happiness is knowing that we came from God or going back to Him. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto the God who gave it. Happiness is discovering where we came from, God, and where we're going to. Here is the answer that the world has spent billions of dollars of listening for, uh, trying to research and discover, is right here in the Word of God. God gave us a spirit of life, and it's going back to Him. We won't be left behind. We're going to God after this life is over. Happiness is discovering the source of life is not a bunch of random molecules. We're not primordial ooze that stepped out of the uh, oozy lake billions of years ago and decided to... Uh, why would a fish want to leave the water anyway and crawl onto the shore? I think it's time for me to crawl onto the shore. How would he know? He's got the brain the size of a pea, or less than a half of a pea. Why would he think such a thought? It doesn't make sense. We were made by God and for His glory and for His purposes and for our happiness. Uh, listen, happiness is discovering the source of life and it's right here in the Bible, not a bunch of random molecules. You, ever, you interview these college students today and they believe it's all by accident. They've been brainwashed and they've been taught. Uh, I was brainwashed in college to believe that we were just a bunch of random molecules. They were just uh, one day we decided to crawl out of that ocean and, and decide to develop eyes and the most complicated intricate design made by God is the human eye. And a creature is going to crawl out and after looking at the sun, how can he look at the sun in the first place? He's blind, but he can see the sun or point toward the sun. All of a sudden an eye develops over millions of years. Well, that's a long time to stare up and wait for his eye to develop. It doesn't make sense. But it has to make sense to them because they have no sense. And the Bible gives them the answer, but they don't want to look to the Word of God and they won't ever discover the source of life. They'll never be happy in the Lord because they've ignored Him and given glory to the creature instead of the Creator. And that, my friends, is a pathway to cursing in your life. God is a source of everlasting life by our faith and trust in Him and the source of life now on this earth. Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. How to be happy? Psalm 144, 15, Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. They recognize Him in every area, every part of their lives. Discover the source of true life. Jesus Christ and His Word. Secondly, Happiness is knowing about wondrous things. Look at Psalm 119, 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful truths in your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of the book that you've written. How many of us open our Bibles and say, how boring this is going to be. i got to read the Bible today. i got to put my ten minutes in reading the Bible. Well, I'm glad you're doing it. 
But let me tell you what the, your Bible contains. Your Bible contains the Word of God. Do you know who God is? God who hung the moon on nothing and set the stars and planets in their place. That's who wrote the Bible. The God who created you and made you even though your flesh is corrupted by sin and your soul and, soul and spirit belongs to God. God created you for a purpose and a reason to bring glory to His name and happiness to you. So how can you pick up the Bible and not be excited? Let me tell you, my Bible reading way back when I was in college and in high school when a preacher said, you know, this is the Bible is the Word of God. And I got to thinking, it is the Word of God. God speaking to us. God inspired me to write it. I began to get excited about the Bible. Listen. How can you pick up the Bible with no excitement? Can you feel the excitement of the author here in Psalms as he anticipates reading God's Word? He had a scroll. He didn't have all these verses laid out like we do with numbers and nice Bibles with this great paper we have. Uh, well, computer Bibles and iPhone Bibles and all kinds of uh, tablets that have Bibles on it don't have to turn a page. You never wear out your Bible. You know, uh, this Bible here is only used for preaching. I've had it for 27 years. You see, it's not even worn. Don't have a mark in it. I do all my study with a Bible on computer. That can't wear out. I've had to replace. I'm on my third keyboard. <laughs> and my fingers flew off and I've had them sewn on many times. But the excitement. Can you sense the excitement he has? The zeal he has? What wondrous things are in the Bible? Let me tell you some wondrous things that are in your Bible. Creation. God created man and put him in the garden. God created man and put him in a garden. A wondrous, wonderful thing. We can't even imagine how beautiful the Garden of Eden was. We can't imagine the colors, the flowers. We think we have beautiful flowers today. We have no idea what the Garden of Eden was like. Wondrous. Salvation is a wondrous thing in the Bible. The most wondrous thing of all, probably. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's a wondrous thing. That's a marvelous thing. We don't have to worry about what's the next step. We're going to step into this life and into eternity because of Jesus Christ and His salvation. A wondrous thing. And then it's not over. Recreation. The rapture. Heaven. The 1,000 year reign of Christ. A new heaven and a new earth. Wondrous things to look forward to for the church. Hey, church, we shouldn't ever be bored with the Bible. It's exciting. We've not even begun to live yet. We've not even begun. Recreation. That's when everything's made anew and we're going to have a heavenly home. But Jack, I don't want to pluck a heart for all eternity. Can you pluck one now? No. Well, you won't have to pluck one in heaven. <laughs> God will put you doing something that you'll love to do. You'll find it exciting. I talked to a young man yesterday at the football game who said he had a wonderful job and he loved it. I said, well, what do you do? Well, I work two hours a day. Every day. Six days a week. But I love it. I said, man, how do you get a job like that? Who wouldn't love two hours a day? How many, uh, he works in retail. I said, how many customers do you have? Probably five a day. Man... <laughs> How much do you make an hour? About $18 an hour. I want your job. Of course, he can't raise a family on two hours a day, but he don't want no family. He don't want no stinking wife. He just wants his $2,000 gaming system on his computer. I saw a kid yesterday at the football game. People were going crazy in the cold. I was just laying back in 15 pieces of clothing, laying there just as snug as a bug in a rug. And... Uh, Tulsa High School Brent's team played a playoff game yesterday afternoon. It was 40 degrees and the wind blowing. And this kid bought three... <laughs> These teenagers are crazy. Three or four bags of popcorn this kid bought. And he, 
he, he looked just like Blake. And he pulled up in front of this, all his friends and just poured the popcorn on everybody. Here, you can stay warm now, pop popcorn. <laughs> I told the guy next to me, now, somebody has to clean that up. That was what I was thinking. <laughs> Nobody's going to eat that popcorn. Here, everybody stay warm now. we got hot popcorn. What is the matter with people? I thought of the waste of money, and who's going to clean that up? I mean, that's a wondrous thing God has done for us. What wondrous things are in your life? Your children, your spouse, your family. Your life itself is a wondrous thing. All these are ordained by God and given by God and described as blessings in the Bible. Your life's work is a wondrous thing ordained by God. Your know, work is blessed and ordained by God. Ecclesiastes 3.22 says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. Even if it's two hours a day. But as, a wondrous, as wondrous as these things are, it's the Bible that tells us of greater, marvelous, wondrous things to come, as I said. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Revelation 2, uh, 21, 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And the former things are passed away. Revelation 22, 3 and 4. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face. That, my friends, is wondrous. And it's in store for all of us that know Jesus Christ. How can we be happy? Psalm 144, 15. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. By knowing about God and experience the wondrous things that God has prepared for us in this life and in the life to come, we can be happy. And finally, happiness is realizing this world is only temporary. Psalm 119, 19. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. I am a stranger and a temporary resident on the earth. I'm here just for a little while. Do not hide your word from me. Hide not thy commandments from me. The psalmist appears, appeals for God to reveal to him his truth. He wants to know what God is saying to him, not what he wants to say to God. He wants to know what God is saying to him. Now how many of us know the difference? A lot of people say, I want to know what uh, God wants and I want to ask Him what He wants me to do. How about if you wait and see what God is saying to you first before you start asking God a bunch of questions. What is He saying to you? What is He saying to you? Before you rise up and complain about what God's doing in your life, how about hearing His side of the story? Listen to what God is saying to you. How can we listen to God? How do we know what God is saying? Through the Word of God. And God speaks to our hearts through His Word. He doesn't want man's truth taken out of the Bible, the psalmist. He doesn't want man's truth taken out of the Bible. He wants God's truth as revealed in the Bible. He doesn't want man to take, oh, this is what it means. This is what it's saying to me. He wants it to say what it says to him. What is God saying to me? Period. Not what I feel He's saying or what I want Him to say, or what is the Bible saying to us? I'm a stranger in the earth. We're only here for a little while. We only live a short time. My grandfather lived to be 92 and was surprised how short his life was and quickly vanished away. We are just ships in the night. We're but a, but a vapor that appears in the morning and then vanishes. Knowing the brevity of life, it's no wonder that uh, this man sought God's wisdom and direction. He, he appeals to God for revelation, for God to reveal to him his will and wisdom for his life. He appeals to God for direction. He appeals to God for clarity. Hide not thy commandments from me. What do you want me to do, God, with my life? What do you want me to do? Well, God will show you what to do through his word. See, as you read the Word of God, it speaks to your heart, opens up your heart and mind, and God begins to direct you and lead you and guide you in the way He wants you to go. 
and then I am a stranger in the earth because happiness is knowing that you are going to die. Now, Jack, you're crazy. How is happiness knowing that you're going to die? Well, everybody in here knows that. Could be tomorrow. Could be 50 years. Not likely for some of you. It could be <laughs> 20 minutes, 20 years. How can that make you happy? How can it make you happy to know that you're going to die and leave this body in this world? Well, I want you to think about the five reasons that you don't want to live forever in this body on this earth. There's five reasons you wouldn't want to live forever in this body on this earth. First of all, you would be an old person forever. You can't walk, you can't chew, you can't remember, you can't hear. And the big three, the big three about getting old, you can't poop, you can't see, but you can pee everywhere and on everything. You want to be like that forever? We'll edit that out of the video. <laughs> Number two. <clears throat> Can you say pee from the pulpit? I don't know. You don't want to live forever in this body, in this world, because you'll be around your crazy family forever. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, some of you have been married 50 years. Can you imagine being married 50 million years? <laughs> Number three. You don't want to live forever in this world, in this body, because you'll be shackled by this body forever. You'll be shackled to this body. You know, our soul and spirit long to be free from this body. We have no idea what it's like not to be shackled. We can imagine, but the Bible calls the body a temple. It's a dwelling place for the soul and the spirit. So we were meant to do more than just dwell in this body and be shackled to the earth. You know, gravity keeps us shackled. We were meant to soar, to pass through walls. Look what Jesus did. He was here and He was gone. He suspended all time and space when He was in His resurrection body. That's what we were meant to be like. You don't want to be in this body forever. Fourthly, you don't want to live forever in this world, this body, because you'll be confined to this earth forever. To the earth. Maybe to Tommy Hawk. That would be awful, wouldn't it? Our destiny is to walk in heaven, the streets of gold, the city, the celestial city, the new heaven and the new earth. We weren't meant to just dwell on this earth, as hard as that is for us to understand. We were, our destiny is to see the, the, the universe that God has made. And fifthly, you don't want to live forever in this body, in this world, because you'll be a sinner eternally. You'll never get away from sin You'll never get away from its effect. You'll continue to get sick and get well. You just won't die if that's possible. Well, it's possible. You'll never get away from sin and its effect. We weren't created to live in a sinful world. We were created to be holy and righteous and perfect. Through Jesus Christ, the God-man, we will be. That's why Jesus was perfect and gives His righteousness to us so that we can be like Him one day, be redeemed from this body of sin and to be perfect forever. Somebody asked me uh, in the jail ministry one time, well, can't you sin again once you get to heaven? No, sin will not exist anymore. It has been defeated on the cross and forever is gone. Sin is a part of this fallen world, this life we live. It will no longer be possible to sin. You cannot fall out of heaven. Well, the angels did. The angels never were redeemed. See? The angels weren't redeemed by the Lamb of God and the blood. Happiness is knowing that this world is only temporary. Philippians 1, 21 and 23. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. How can we be happy? Psalm 144, 15. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Happy is that people who realizes this life is only temporary. Happy is that people who know that this life is just a dress rehearsal for eternity. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come for me and for you. The best. Just because we have a president... Yes, I'm going there. Just because we have the last trump, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 
Okay, nobody's going to bite on Trump. I don't know. Did y'all realize there was an election a couple of weeks ago? I mean, we have a Trump in the White House. We will have. Uh, are you guys going to go on January 20th to all the, the uh, protests? And they're going to burn down Washington, I guess. Uh, what a bunch of rotten losers. I mean, <laughs> it's worse than a Kentucky fan losing a game. Kentucky fans, we make every excuse in the world. Well, they cheated us. We got to have, a, we demand a recount. We demand something. We got to have, Kentucky can't lose. You just can't. That's what the, this country sounds like today. She can't lose. <laughs> People, get on with your life. It's just an election. Just the biggest one in history. But it, <laughs> it's just an election. God is still on the throne. Everything's going to be okay. Jesus Christ is Lord. And whether Donald... Here's the question we have. Is Donald Trump God's judgment? Or is Donald Trump God's reprieve? That is something time will tell. Is he what we deserve? Is we... Is we is he what God has given us as a reprieve to give people time to repent? I don't know. All I can tell you is, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for Donald Trump to take the office and think everything's going to be alright. Jesus is not coming to get his church. We have a, a reprieve here. No. Donald Trump may be the president after the rapture. I don't know if he's saved or not. They claim he's accepted Christ. I don't know. It's like the guy who said, how do you know there's a, a heaven and a, and a hell? I'm trying to get the story straight. How do you know there's a hell? And the person said, well, when I uh, die, I'll let you know when you get there. Or if I, when I die, I'll let you know. Well, how will I know there's a hell? Well, you let us know when you get there. Because that's where you're going, buddy. Uh, I didn't tell that right. <laughs> anyway, you get the gist. You get the gist. Uh, you guys haven't been with it all morning now. Give me one little knot with it. How to be happy. Discover the source of true life. Jesus Christ and His Word. The Bible. Learn and experience in the Bible the wondrous things God gives us in this life and in the life to come. And finally, know that this life is only temporary. The best is yet to come. Let's pray.